Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Sam Higgins from Strike Around Architecture in Greater Manchester, and hopefully, I'm going to keep you interested for 15 minutes while I whistle through a live job where we've effectively taken a geometric approach to the modelling that we've done and the information production that we've done at the end. So, hopefully, it's an insight into the way that you can use the geometry engine inside Dynamo, plug into Revit, and get some cool results out. Uh, the project that I'm showing you um, is King's Cross Energy Centre. Um, it's this strange little red section of the site which we inherited from a design architect at stage three. Um, they created effectively a very large energy shed with uh, a series of articulated fins starting relatively high, going down to relatively low from the side. Um, their information we were presented with was relatively dull. We needed to get it Revit friendly so we could detail it up and fabricate it. So our first uh, look at the job was to understand whether or not we could A, do this in Revit on its own, or B, we should go to a more paramet parametrically enabled uh, design solution to get what we needed out. So this is the relatively simple bit. Um, we sit with the project team, we understand what they're good at, they're fantastic at modeling in Revit, we understand lines in Revit, so that's how we sketch it initially. We look at some control curves, which are the red model on which you can see. They're on work surfaces, so they're not possible to make the model. But effectively, they're the things that we bring into Dynamo that modeling with. Um, as you can see, you select them on the lines, get the element geometry, and um, I don't know if you covered this daily, but a start, end, step code block, going from zero at the start of the curve to one at the end with X steps in between. It's a really nice, uh, concise way of defining something in time. So we start at zero, go to one, and we've got a number of bins parameter. Just like that, we subdivide that curve once we use curve points as parameter. Notice how that's set to be uh, cross product product version that David spoke about earlier, and that gives us all the possible results of that intersection of fins that gets us to model ones. So we create some geometry relatively easily. We take the points that we have in the top row, the points that we have in the bottom, and we transpose the list, like David said earlier. And then we're able to take point at top, point at bottom, point at top, point at bottom, and join them up into vertical lines. So that's the initial geometry. We can then play with our slider, increase the amount, decrease it, and it's nice and, nice and malleable. Uh, we can run something called curve points at segment length. Once we understand that our smallest fin size wants to be 600 on this side, and our largest fin size on this, one, uh, on this side wants to be the whole length minus 600, we can piece those into a start end step, which is 600 n minus 600, and the initial amount of fin slider that we've got to create a curve point at segment length. Notice how that's just set to normal lacing. And that gives us what intersection of these curves that gradually gets smaller as it moves down. So at this point, we're kind of aware that we can describe the geometry in Dynamo, and we're thinking, yeah, this is definitely the right route to go down because we can start plugging in Revit stuff to this now. Um, the last bit of proof of concept was subdividing those lines with the dots on into a series of top lines and a series of bottom lines. So we've got a bit of a robust geometry to build upon. So concept approved, everybody's happy. We then move into an environment that we're more familiar with, that the project team is happy with, and that's adaptive components. Uh, hopefully you've had a go with adaptive components, plug it into Dynamo and see how powerful that is. Um, in this instance, this is one fin, and there are two adaptive points with a nested profile located on them, and there's this control point at the front. Uh, on the leading uh, plane of this control point, we've snapped this profile point and this profile point. So as the control point moves its way around the curve, the orientation of the adaptive component moves with the curve. So you can imagine rotating manually uh, each of these adaptive components around the sweep of the curve that we've got, which would be quite difficult. So we filter in this bit of uh, control geometry. Uh, so we're relatively happy with the uh, adaptive component we've created, and we work out a way of placing it using the Dynamo stuff that we've made. Now, jump back into Revit, we get the project guys to offset curve just as a notional control point. And we start performing some of the procedures that we did earlier. I've added a bit of colour now because it starts to get a bit interesting. <laughs> now, uh, we bring in the element geometry of that third model line. And like I say, we run the same kind of procedural subdivisions along there. So we're still working with our number of pins and our start and end step. Curve points are parameter to subdivide this third line. This the amount of points we need. Uh, we can then take the end point of these purple lines and each of these points we do a line by start point, end point to visualize how the relationship between 
between adaptive components placement and its control line. It's done to that. So still quite simple. We're looking at three rails and some intercepts and geometry. Then we move into list management. Um, this is David's forte. I hope you'll uh, appreciate this bit. Um, so we look at the things I've illustrated are the, the top fins. And there's a start point and an end point for those lines I showed you earlier. And there's a control point. And we get the, the whole list of all the possible start points, the whole list of all the possible end points, and the whole list of all the control points. And we make a list out of those. So we've got list tray, top, bottom, control. And then we transpose those from a list of x, x, x into trios, into three points. So we've got adaptive component placement, point one, two, and the control point. We're able to feed that into the adaptive components, which enables us to place x amount of adaptive components in the exact position that Dynamo is generated. Uh, the, this is relatively straightforward, but I'd argue this is where Dynamo geometry interfaces with Revit quite fantastic. You can describe points in three-dimensional space, you can place Revit stuff, and it's, it's great once you crack that. Um, we're able to add some data to this, so we can make each fin aware of its position by a little bit of code blockery. Uh, we can say that this fin, this pair of fins, is in position 37. And this is enough to get discussions going with the contractor and uh, fabricator. But what was important for us, because we'd inherited the design from somewhere else, we were invariably going to get value engineered. We were going to have to uh, talk with different stakeholders, like the local authority, the contractor, uh, the design architect. We wanted to play around with how we could make this more efficient. So the slider that we had at the beginning, we were able to quickly visualize what would happen if we brought that slider right down to 50 fins, whether the design was still the same. Um, we eventually settled on 120, which is the subdivision that you can see there. Uh, this process remained robust to the end, so we were still able to tweak things if we wanted. So once we were at that point, we then wanted to start scheduling things. And instead of embedding the Revit geometry with information, we just thought we'll take the information out of time. And we're querying the length of each one of these lines and writing that back to the fin length parameter in each one of these in our schedule. And we're describing whether or not a fin at position one is either upper or lower. Starting adding more data into the set so that our fabricator at the end of the day knew what they were going to put out. So we could have left it there and said, okay, we've documented all these things, we've got a variable process where we can describe you know, multiple instances with one definition. But we thought, let's think about geometry in terms of view creation. And this is where the game steps a little bit. Um, if you imagine one method for creating a section in Revit uh, describes a a coordinate system, which is basically a, like a, a UCS, if, if you know that kind of terminology, um, a direction of the world relative to a point. So if we can understand a point, a plane, an extent of a bounding box, we can describe a view, which seems like quite basic, but as soon as you imagine that we could describe a view for a multiple views for every single one of these things, we can start to document all the information about them automatically, which kind of gets me excited. Whatever, you've got to keep in the back of your mind that there's an imaginary geometry of a bounding box around these elements. So, bear with me a second. Um, we're going to create the side views here. I've done the front and the plan, which you can see detail later if you like. If you imagine we're trying to create the, the base of this particular imaginary box that we've got. So, we're going to use a rectangle. And we're going to keep with the number of fins, our start, end, step. But instead of curved points of parameter, we're going to express a curved coordinate system parameter, which effectively allows us, when we say we're going to create a rectangle by coordinate system, we can rotate our rectangle along the curve as it moves along. So it stays in keeping with the direction of the curve, which is nice because we can build geometry on top of that. We can deconstruct that rectangle into this green line, which is perpendicular to the direction of the center point of the curve, and this opposite parallel line, which gives us two lines for us to construct this central piece of geometry from. We get that by taking curve point of parameter of this green line, curve point of parameter of this black line, from the point there to the point there. Next slide shows us creating the red line in between those two points, and then we've got a, a directional vector effectively that we can query. We can look at the zero point of the red line, and that can be where we're going to place the view. Imagine that's where we'll be standing looking at our view. Uh, the red line itself, if we query the normal of the parameter that we're stood at, gives us the direction of the view. So it says, you're stood here and you're looking this way, which is relatively 
dreadful way of looking at things. Um, and we can use those to say the place where we're at, the place where we're looking, and a vector z axis saying that we want the orientation to be up. And we can make a coordinate system from that geometry. So we'll bank that for a second and think about the extents of this box that we're trying to describe. We're trying to describe the width of it and the maximum height so that we've got the bounding box columns. And we do that by specifying a series of points, uh, effectively our minimum width and our minimum height. And these are about dynamo's zero geometry, which is why we need the coordinate system translation. Because we draw these down here and we apply our CS with our min point and our max point, and we're able to create exception view by coordinate system, min point and max point. Which is really, really robust actually. It's a fantastic way of creating sections. I think it supersedes any of the automated ele elevation creation. So it's well worth a look at. But if you can visualize, the imaginary uh, cuboid isn't there, but all the constituent parts of it are. So we can describe these views. Um, this is an example of one of the views that came out from this process, a direct slice section that shows the two things that we're interested in. Um, we repeated this for a front view as a section and a plant view as a section. And all of a sudden, we had 120 components, three views of each, which was good. Um, we were able to name them, apply a view template, adjust the far clip offset of the views, and do various other things to uh, unify the way they look. Um, we effectively make a list of these things, of the, the sections, the elevations, the plants, and we've got 120 in each block. And again, going back to David's favorite, the transpose node, we're able to take, we're able to take plant, section, elevation, in one list, plant, section, elevation, and another one, plant, section, elevation, all, iterate through all 120 pins that we've got. We're able to group those together, create a name for each of the sheets that we want, number for each of the sheets that we want, and apply family type. And that will generate us, using this out-of-the-box node, sheet by title, name, uh, by name, number, title, block, and views, a view with each three views positioned on it. But if you understand this, this node, you'll gauge that when Revit builds it, it just chucks all, all the views into kind of the left-hand corner, and you want them to be positioned nicely. So another bit of uh, geometry translation, you can take these really cool uh, packages, fit from Archibald, sheet viewports, and two nodes from Steam nodes to get the viewport location of any viewport on a view. And we can use a bit of vector multiplication to say, this view is currently here, multiply it by a vector and put it here. And we iterate through all the options that we've got. What it leaves us with, once we've gone through this massive process, might seem over the top, but we've got a very robust way of creating 120 documentation sheets each with a plan section and orient uh, plan section and elevation oriented to a unique piece of geometry as it moves its way through the code. Um, I put my feet up and made, made a cup of tea at this point, uh, trying to convince myself that I'm not going to be out of a job in six months, frankly. Um, but this is now perfect for uh, fabrication and additional detailing. And if you can imagine its application in structural steel work, that maybe on an angle that you struggle to put a view around previously, we can suddenly automate all that once we understand the bounding box parameters. Um, incidentally, this is what the project looks like. Um, everything was correct on site. All, uh, all fins arrived on time. They were manufactured uh, precisely and within the cost. So we were thanked, let's say, by the fabricator for an over production of information. But ultimately, they really helped streamline the process. Sorry if I spanked through that a bit quickly, but that's geometry in a nutshell for us at Stride.